With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. If you get a custom tailored suit, it's going to fit perfectly and make you look great. Think about that with a Noble First for your organization. No matter what the size of your company is, a Noble First will analyze your data and collaborate with you to custom tailor digital solutions so you can focus on making your organization grow. When it comes to data centric solutions specifically for your organization, choose a Noble First. A Noble First makes living simple. See for yourself at anoblefirst.com. E N N O B L E First.com. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with me, your host, Stephen Wallace, for part four of All Over the World with Jenny Thompson. Jenny, who at the time of recording had visited 56 countries, talks in part four about spending Christmas at home in Adelaide, the joys of travelling, the mental health benefits cricket brings to people and the continuing growth of the women's game. As always, there's never a dull moment with Jenny, who brings joy wherever she goes on her world cricket tour. Hello, Jenny. Welcome back to All Over the World Part 4. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Well, there will be a Part 5 and probably a Part 6 because we'll come back to you again at the end of the tour. But resuming after Part 3, Christmas and New Year, you spent that back in Australia. Yeah, that's right. I was in Adelaide. I was actually supposed to go to the MCG, but unfortunately, my friend who was going with was sick, so we had to stay behind and make sure she was okay. But nevertheless, I had lots of time in Australia, just Adelaide, just sitting on my couch, watching the test. I went to the um, W... W, the BBL, double BL, <laughs> BBL on um, New Year's Eve with... Adelaide Strikers, that's our traditional match now. That's our traditional thing to do. I had some friends over from Vietnam who I'd played cricket with in Vietnam. I used to play cricket with them back in England. And, you know, it was really wonderful. It was just really nice to show them around. And then I've been managing to play some club cricket here and there for the men's and the women's here in Adelaide, which has been really good. I've also been playing quite a lot of golf with Rabin Riker the Netherlands all-rounder who's just getting ready to go to the um, Global World Cup qualifiers um, in April in Dubai. So, yeah, I'm not sure that the golf was going to be too much handy for her batting, but I don't know, hand-eye, it's all good training, isn't it? Well, that's what the England men all seem to do, practice golf more <laughs> than the cricket. That's right. That's right. And while you are in Australia, um, which as uh, your home is in Adelaide. You also met uh, a double centurion in the Australian women's cricket team. Yes, I did. Um, yes, Joanne Broadbent. She was the first Australian woman to hit a double century in a test match. And um, she did that in the late 90s. And, you know, you and I, we always talk about how things aren't really that long ago when things were so different. There's no coverage of the match. So she said, I think I got the 200 by flicking it off my legs, but I'm not sure. But she said, I'm not normally a hard-hitting batter, but I actually whacked it that hard that I was dropped on 195 by Charlotte Edwards, who was bowling. She said she dropped it and it went for four. And it wasn't that there was a small boundary. 
But yeah, so Joe Broadbent is the gonna she's just so um I'm a bit obsessed with Joe to be honest. She's gonna be the first uh one of the first female match referees in Australia. She's just been appointed to do that training and Kepler Vessels is gonna be her mentor, which is super cool. I love Kepler growing up. He's brilliant. So um she's doing that. She's obviously coaching at Fairbreak, she's coached the WBBL, she's coached in New Zealand. She's just she's an absolute phenomenon. And she's she's just a brilliant human. And she's from Adelaide. So yeah, I mean I'd met her met her before going to Fairbreak for the first match of my tour back only a year ago now, feels like ten. And then I saw her in Hong Kong and then yeah, I catch up with her quite regularly when she comes back to Adelaide. She lives in Brisbane now. Um, oh, I went. I went a bit Australian then. She lives in Brisbane now. <laughs> um, yeah, so she's a brilliant human. But watch this space because Joe and I. I can tell you exclusively, Joe and I are doing a little collaboration, which you'll see is coming out around ooh, August. So watch that space. But also, Joe's now writing a book about her career and funny stories. She's very funny that happened within. Um, within her time which I think is bloody brilliant and you know I'm always encouraging any woman in particular to write a book particularly if it's about women's cricket because I'm sure I've told you this stat before but you know even my book hopes to redress the statistic that there's more books on Don Bradman than there are on women's cricket in its entirety. So, you know, it's really important to tell stories of women's cricket, particularly when, for example, there was no footage of that match. So, you know, just to have the recollection, the recollections is, it's super important. And the voices and the stories, you know, all these things. So, yeah, Joe's doing a lot. I don't know how she fits it all in, but, you know, her time management is very excellent. Yeah, Joe's match was at Guildford in, funny enough, August 1998, and Joanne scored 200, exactly. Just, I asked her about it recently because of, um, in the light of Annabelle, Annabelle Sutherland smashing that just delightful, delightful 200. So that made her the fifth Aussie woman, woman to do that. So I asked Jo about her own innings and she said she started on the last session of one day, batted the whole day of the next day and then continued for the morning of the third day. Just, you know, I struggle these days because I play 2020. You struggle when you go and play a 40. <laughs> so that's insane concentration. I said, how did you deal with that? What did you do? And she just said, you know, that, thing they will say about knowing when to switch on and off she said there was never anything more important than doing that at that day well not just that day those three days well i've got to mention because in in this particular match because three of the people that played in this match have all been on this podcast uh sue redfern bowled 21 overs uh katherine leng who's been on the podcast quite a lot she bowled 24 overs and uh, batting, opening the batting for Australia was Lisa Kitely. So they've all been on this podcast. So the Pad and Path Club. Yeah, a bit of an advert you'll there. Have for... You'll have to send them a badge. Yes, a badge. Yeah, you'll have to. Uh, I'm sure they'll like the badge. Um, but just to, uh, I don't think Sue and um, Catherine will uh, remember the game well because Australia scored 599. 599 for six, I think I've, I've looked up here. So I'm sure they'll remember. 569 for six declared. So I'm sure Catherine and Sue will remember the game well bowling. Uh, Lisa yeah. Kitely probably will remember it because uh, Lisa scored 56 and she must have been batting a lot with Joanne because uh, they were two and three. So, uh, yeah, they, they added over 100 for the second wicket, Lisa and uh, Joanne. Jenny, you also met an Australian women's captain as well. Yeah, I did. So Jill Kinnair, um, she's a South Australian as well, and she had led Australia against India in India, which was just quite the experience. So 
Jill was on my list of South Aussies who I really like to talk with. So there was Joe, Jill and Karen Walton, who was my club captain when I first came to Australia. So loads of history with Karen. So I said to my neighbour who was really interested in my project about this time last year, I said, oh, you know, um, I'd really love to speak with Jill Canar. I think it would just be really cool. And she's, I said, I wonder where she lives. You know, I wonder where she is in this vast state of South Australia. It's absolutely massive, this state. And she said, she, Jen, she lives three streets away from us. I said, does she? She's in our suburb. And she said, yeah. And it just really, really, really struck me that imagine if you had Steve Waugh or Ricky Ponting or Alan Border in your suburb, even if you didn't know cricket, you would know they're in your suburb. And that tells a story like what we were saying about Joe, you know, the, I call them invisible giants. It tells you a story about the invisible giants and the importance, again, of, you know, recognising um, women who have done so much and achieved so much. And she's absolutely massive in lacrosse as well. She's just one of those talented, natural sports women. And I've heard stories of her batting prowess you know she's so 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 highly regarded and it's just it's actually a criminal shame that there's no footage to watch of her playing but yeah so um I met her for coffee this time last year and then I've been doing some talks in uh well I've been doing quite a few talks but one of the talks with I do is with um, my neighbour and a load of um, bunch of really inspirational women. So um, I did a talk for them before I went on tour, and then we had a catch up when I came back after the first year. And Jill turned up, and I didn't know she was going to be there. And it really, you know, I was really like really nervous because Jill can I has come to my talk. I was like thinking she'll be the other way round. But you know what was brilliant was um, the talk. The talk was really quite organic. So there was loads of you know places where Jill had loads of really great insights to add. You know, often with me going, Jill, you would know you know better than me. Or what's your experience of that? You know, or you know what I'm seeing around the world at the moment is how it used to be in many ways, so how might it be in the future? And she just had loads and loads of interesting things to contribute. So, you know, it's it's really, really fascinating to me that, like I say, these invisible giants, they walk amongst us, and it's so, so crucial that we register and record everybody's stories for future, not least because... It's just very, very interesting as well. You know, when, when you come across a story that not many people know, then it's important that we share and retell those stories. And they're not that long ago, considering, are this, they? This is the whole thing. Completely crazy. The progress, really, and the fact that where we are right now with women's cricket and women's sport in general is so exciting. The opportunities and the potential, we're just at the beginning. There's so much to do, so, so, so much to do. And the further I go around the world, the more people I talk to, the more the more things go on my list of things that need to be done. But, but it's going to happen. That's the exciting thing. Well, it will with people like you around, Jenny. Uh, excitement i wanted to ask you about traveling and hotels that on part two of all around the world you uh booked two flight tickets for the same flight have you done that again or um well i don't know if i told you last time but what was quite funny was i i booked completely the wrong country to the wrong country and they wouldn't let me get my money back on it though which is fair enough but they say we'd give you a refund on the tax but they completely ignored my messages about that so I thought oh here we go and then the day before the flight it says you can now check in for this completely pointless flight that you you don't need because you're not nowhere near that country this was in South America 
anyway, I was like, mm, I'm not feeling good about that, but okay, I'll wear it. Fine. That was my mistake. And then I kept getting all these updates on the day for the flight. It said, I'm very, very sorry, but your flight's been cancelled due to industrial action, so you can have a full refund. <laughs> so I was pretty happy about that. I haven't done, as far as I'm aware, I haven't done any double booking. I booked for completely the wrong month in Argentina, so I ended up double paying in that respect, but that wasn't, oh, it's just a calamity. As my mum says, I don't know how you get around the world, but, you know, my bag went, um, my bag went in uh, Vanuatu. I wasn't, I didn't have my bag for the whole of Vanuatu because I was barely getting on the plane. They cancelled the first one from Fiji. He said, come again 24 hours later. I got an email to say I'm on that flight. Turned up at the airport and they were trying to bump me. But I only then would have had 12 hours in Vanuatu if I'd come the next day on that flight, if I'd got on that flight and it hadn't been cancelled because apparently they do that all the time with Air Vanuatu. So I was quite desperate to get on this plane. And I sort of panicked. And when I panic, I do really stupid things. And I really panicked. And I was like, it's just so important that I get to Vanuatu. Um, it's really important. Um, I was on the television today and I showed them a picture of me going on Fiji TV. And in the end, I think Mary just was like, oh, just get on the plane. But she said, you can't. Your bag's not getting on because we're overweight. It's a very small plane. So it's, it's OK. No worries. And then um, by the time it turned up, it turned up about an hour before I was due out of Vanuatu. So I picked it up and uh, put it on the next flight out to, <laughs> to Brisbane. But also with that, um, I said, but I was talking with Trevor at the service desk. I said, but Trevor, I've got all these donations for Cricket Vanuatu. Where can I leave them? Because I was supposed to take them to Cricket Vanuatu. And he said, oh, you can just leave them with me. And he just picked up the bag and carried it up the stairs and then came back. And I was like, I was still there saying, do you want to take, do you want to take any details of me or who's going to pick it up or whatever? She said, no, just get them to swing by the desk. So I messaged uh, the CEO of Vanuatu, Tim, who's going to pick, the um, bag up when he gets back from playing in Malaysia. Um, and I just said, you know, oh, just swing by the customer service desk after Trevor. He's like, that's very Vanuatu. And I loved Vanuatu because not just because you get around on the back of a ute on the tray, you just sit there and you don't need seat belts or anything. We did some donuts around the VCG, the Vanuatu Cricket Ground, and it was just really fun. I was really sad I only had 36 hours there, but I just have to go back, like with all the other countries. Yeah, you left out a, a reprise of a tour, weren't you? Uh, any right. dangerous flights? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was one um, coming into Belize in a hurricane, and it was also the tiniest flight ever. I think there were 10 seats. And there were about two people and on the plane. And um, the turbulence was really quite frightening. And as we landed, it was very bumpy. I was like, I've got a video there. So, yeah, it's like, <laughs> uh, and um, I remember because I look back on the video, I said, I don't normally clap when we land, but I'm clapping today. Yeah, so there's been a few little tiny planes which I'm always a bit sus about. But other than that, you know, statistically, commercial flying is so much safer than getting in a car or anything. In fact, I did have a little bingle, as they call them out here, in my car today. It was a long story. A bollard jumped out at me. And um, I've been wanting a new golf club. And my friend, I, I rang her, I was like, oh, I'm just on my car. And my friend, she knew I wanted this golf club and she kept, she turned up. She said, oh, I've just got one off, off Facebook Marketplace for you because you're having a really bad day. And because you actually need a good driver. I was like, that's really mean. But it was quite a funny joke. And I got a new driver. So, yeah. I mean, I'm chaos. I'm chaos in my own house or 
my own car. So, you know, I trust pilots a lot more than anything else, I think. And do you know how many miles you've actually done? No, I haven't uh, looked at my carbon footprint. I, I daren't really. And, you know, people keep saying to me, oh, well, at least your air miles will be massive. But, you know, I'm flying on lots of different airlines and they're not all joined up. So, you know, I could maybe get, get an orange juice on the plane next time I'm in South America. But I'm not going very far on any air miles. But, you know, these are just like, poor me. What What problems to have in my life, you know? Hello, it is Ryan. And I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on Chumbacasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me. And you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. It is Ryan here and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper, a woo a hand clapper, a high-fiver? I kind of like the high-five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At ChumbaCasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18+. plus. What about all the the different hotels and places you've stayed? Yeah, I like having a mix up of things, uh, places. So sometimes I'll stay with people and they're very game to have me. Like Roberta stayed with her in Brazil. I stayed with someone I didn't know called Chantal in the Netherlands. It was really fun. Um, She's coming to Australia. She's coming to stay with me this time. So we're having a little cultural exchange this summer, this Australian summer. But yeah, the accommodation, I'll just go for pretty much obviously the cheapest that I can get because I'm paying for this myself and I'm not there very long as well, which keeps the cost down. But there are some places naturally as a solo woman woman traveller that you want to pay a little bit more for a little bit of a better area that's notoriously a bit safer. So yeah, but other than that, you know, people keep saying to me, well, do you not get really fed up of hotel rooms or this or that? But, you know, there's always something new or quirky or different or something about wherever you stay. So I just never get bored of anything. I'm just always fascinated and excited. And if it's a bit weird or dodgy or silly or whatever, then that's material. And if it's nice, then that's nice. I guess the whole tour has evolved as you went along. I, I, you, I think you've been to 55 countries. Did you anticipate going to as many when you first started? No. In fact, it's good that you point out. So just having got back from Vanuatu makes it 56. And I was talking at the beginning of the tour um, with Alan from Cricket Japan. And we go way back as friends before cricket um, in either of our lives. So, um yeah, I was talking with him and how to frame the tour, and he suggested at the time, January. look at January the 1st of last year and the rankings. Anyone with an ICC ranking, T20 women's cricket, just go to those countries because otherwise it might be too much. I was saying, you know, it's a bit of an overwhelming idea. How do I frame it? And he suggested that list, and there were 54 countries on it. And I haven't even gone to half the countries on that actual list. But, you know, I just, it's like, oh, I'm just passing through there if I've got to change planes. So I may as well stay over in Colombia for a few days and get a few stories there. Or, you know, oh, I'm in Argentina. I can just get a boat to Uruguay for the day, that sort of thing. So, yeah, um, as Jason Barry, who went round the world playing cricket in the 90s, said to me, you're never off tour. You'll never be off tour now. So I do think it's the never-ending tour because I was actually going to finish my tour this year and then earlier this week um, I've been approached by a company to continue my tour next year and possibly the year after and ad nauseum. So watch this space. You say it's constantly evolving, but it is 
even when I've made some plans, you know, life makes others for you. So, you know, at this point, I'm just rolling with whatever happens because it's all fun and it's all interesting. But what I will be doing is finishing the book at the end of this year. And then, you know, I can always do updated books or sequels or whatever, but the book will concentrate on the first two years because it would be too long if I tried to extend it out to three years, four years, or it would never get done because the tour will never finish. It will be a never-ending story, won't it? Like Lamar. Yeah. That's a flashback. It was in Kachigugu, if you remember. Oh, Kachigugu. That was, they were on the Now That's What I Call Music, Volume 2, I think, with Genesis, Men at Work, Down Under. You're yeah. Showing, you're showing your age that. now, if you if you remember. I was those. three. Three, yeah, of course. <laughs> Just widening a bit for, for women's cricket as we get near yeah. to the end of uh, part four. I'm forgetting myself now. Um, <laughs> what has surprised you as you've gone along on the tour about women's cricket? Okay, first of all, where women's cricket is, which is everywhere. And even even now when I go to a country and they tell me there's no women's cricket, it still seems to pop up. It just seems to be everywhere. So that's really surprised me. And again, talking about my tour evolving, the landscape is evolving at a rapid pace for women's cricket, as we know. But even as my tours kicked off, you know, um, professionalism has come in for Hong Kong women, Scotland women, all these women that are getting contracts. So, I mean, honestly, because of the rapid pace of everything and I'm a slow processor, I still just can't believe the opportunities for women's cricketers here. You know, you can have agent here as in these days. You can have player agents, these massive sponsorships. Um, you can go and play all around the world. It's it's just I don't know. It's constantly really exciting, and I do think I do think it's really really surprising. But I also love the language that. Um, you know, that cricket is translated into. So when I go to South Africa, um, I'm going to pick up a load of books. I took some to Vanuatu and Fiji um, for a book called How's That, which is a beginner's guide to cricket, but already it's been translated into Zulu and they're looking at translating it into other editions. And I really love it. It's not a surprise, but I really love hearing cricket in different languages when you you know, going around worlds and often you might not have any words in that language or just a few and then you'll hear, you know, um, fine leg like, in the middle of, you know, in the middle of the local language or then you'll hear silly bit off. <laughs> I just love that. I really do. I think one of the things that's come through in part three was the benefits uh, that cricket gives mentally and to people. Yeah, I mean, I was, it seems a bit ridiculous to me in retrospect in that I had the decade out from cricket and then it was only when I came back two, three years ago to cricket where I realised how cricket actually just did so much good for my mental health. I'd always taken it for granted as just something I did with my friends, you know, but that's the whole point of it really and you know whenever I go around the world whichever country I'm in I really really seek to emphasize that cricket you know yes we can all work on our skills and do this and do that which is great the game itself is great but you should only be playing it if you're having fun and if you're having fun you'll make friends and if you make friends and you're having fun then you'll all try harder for each other so then your cricket will automatically get better but it's just so good for people's mental health. It's not just good in a self-esteem perspective, but it's actually saving lives in many, many countries, you know, through the social impact programs which are being delivered, the education that has been delivered with in and around cricket. So, you know, cricket in and of itself is so good for your mental health, but just, just the difference that it's making to, for women around the world is is just is just incredible and it, it's so heartwarming and 
what it makes me want to do is just make sure that as many people, boys, girls, women, men, have access and opportunity to cricket as possible. And, you know, that could be any team sport we could talk about. But for me, I'm going to talk about cricket, not least because it is the best sport because you do have that time to get to know each other and that social bonding. is. I don't think you get that as much in any sport. I really don't. I think cricket's got a special culture, but I still think team sports, you know, just deliver, just deliver so much. And I really don't believe that you can overinvest in sport either as a private business or as the government. I just think every dollar pound that goes into sport is so so well spent and particularly in these de- developing countries the challenges you know often cricket will compete against rugby or football or whatever for the dollars but then collectively sports competing against challenges of the infrastructure education health and you know particularly in the developing countries each dollar is so so critical and uh, often I'm actually astonished by how much money governments will spend to, in sport because they realise the benefit that it is for overall for the community and definitely for the individual. But, you know, it's, I mean, who'd want to be a politician? You can never please everybody and you can never make all the right decisions. But, yeah, I mean, of course, I'm going to always say spend as much as you can on cricket because it gives back so much. And travelling around the world like you're doing, it it can only be good for international relations between countries. Well, I'm really, really um, in a great position that I say to everybody, you can please ask me to be introduced to anyone via my personal network. Or if, if I've seen something in a country that I think can help you in your country, I'll put you in contact to have that discussion but of course yeah sports diplomacy uh it's it's absolutely absolutely massive and we've seen that over history i mean remember the match um during the war when the teams had the ceasefire on christmas day so that they could play a match you know it just it transcends everything and politics but yeah it's so crucial to politics at the same time there's definitely a duality there and the future of the tour, you're now back in sunny Adelaide. You were talking about 40 degrees. Mm-hmm. As where I'm looking at now, it's it's pouring with rain here in East Anglia on a a March morning. Uh, where where next for the tour? Well, I've got a supercharged roster, as you can imagine. So I'm going to some really, really super exciting countries, some very iconic countries that we grew up in England in the horrible miserable winter dreaming of these iconic places so i'm going to sri lanka i'm going to get down to gaul and look at the ground there going to india i've been there before but i absolutely love it so i'm going to chennai coincided it with the ipl which would be great going to bangladesh going to see bangladesh australia women play as part of the preparation for bangladesh hosting the world 2020 there later on in the year Going to Nepal, Um, can't say that was ever on my bucket list, but that's the magic of this tour, you know. There's um, always an excuse to go to a different kind of country. Um, I'm going to look at a blind cricket program there, which will be really, really interesting. Um, Also going to Pakistan. Then I'm going over to Africa, to Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Namibia, and then I'm going to Cape Town. Um, I found some domestic cricket that I can watch at Newlands. I cannot wait for that. I mean, that's just going to be so incredibly iconic. Then I go back to England, go to a few European countries, including the Mediterranean Cricket League in Montenegro, and then I'm going to Barbados. Can't believe I'm going to Barbados. I'll be there for the Men's World 2020. So I just got my tickets for Namibia and Oman. <laughs> so, you know... I'll be uh, having a good time there. And there's an England match going to uh, England, Scotland, and then Australia, Oman as well. But I'm also hoping I have, and actually, you could probably set this up for me because um, 
I've got a big long to-do list, so I haven't got around to speaking to Roland yet. But I'm hoping to go and see his Barbados Girls Club. Yes, Roland, yes, yeah. Um, yeah. Barbados Royals, yeah. Yeah, After, that's right. Well, hopefully he'll be there. I know he's coming over here to commentate for the county championship, but uh, no doubt he'll be going back to Barbados during the World Cup. But I, I am checking in with Roland in a couple of weeks' time to talk about England and India. So, uh, yeah, yeah I'll certainly right. mention him to you. Oh, I might have had time to message him by then because I saw him in Jersey. I hung out with his cousin, Raf, and they specifically told me to come to Barbados in June because they'd be there for their World 2020. Yeah, because England are playing in Barbados, aren't they? Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. yeah We're in the same group mm-hmm. as Scotland and Australia. I know that for That's sure. That's right. I'm going to England, Scotland. Right. I think that's about the end of part four of Her World Cricket Tour with Jenny Thompson. Thank you very much for for joining me from Adelaide, an evening in Adelaide. Thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Jenny. Sports Social Podcast Network.